Okay, ladies and gentlemen, a few announcements to get us started. Uh, first, for today's quiz. Uh, well, there won't be a quiz today, but there might be at some point. So it's, oh, wow. Uh, thanks for showing up to lecture and for doing the readings. Um, uh, more serious announcements going forward. Uh, as some of you have been asking, and it's uh, an important thing on our syllabus, the second paper. Uh, as we very briefly announced um, a few weeks ago in talking about the first paper, the second paper has also been pushed back. So the second paper due date is now officially, and this will be posted this afternoon on iSites, it's officially April 8th. It's a Tuesday. Uh, it gives you some time um, uh, after break. And the, the details as well will be up on iSites, but the, uh, the two things we should say about these final assignments. So you sitting here, you sitting there in the seats, listening to these case studies uh, week in and week out, uh, you are surely thinking to yourself, boy, I know a better way to address this problem. I know a strategy for solving this. I know a, a remedy that we might try. Um, and the second paper is really an opportunity for you to take some case we're looking at in the class and uh, both ex explain it very briefly in the first page and then in the rest of the paper set up how you think a remedy might work. That is, tell us how things could be different, tell us how we can solve this problem. Um, in some of these cases, there, we're going to be talking about remedies and you may want to adjudicate between different ones. Uh, it has to be a substantial either original contribution or a real um, wrestling with and helping us understand why certain solutions may or may not work and where the, the best actual uh, resolution lies. So this is an opportunity for you to take what I'm sure has been uh, uh, cognating in your brain sitting there listening to these case studies and actually write it out in a formal, well-argued piece. Uh, as to how we should address uh, one of the cases uh, or a version of the case we have in front of us. For the final project, um, we're really pulling together, together everything in this course. The idea is for you to go out there and find a case on your own um, to identify some form of institutional corruption. It can be as mundane as the quality of the food in your uh, dorm to uh, as grand as the uh, future of the U.S. political system, uh, so long as it can be managed uh, in, a, in a tight, well-argumented, well-documented um, uh, framework. There, there is a multimedia option on this. Uh, we're excited about that. I'm a meeting, uh, we've had a series of meetings with some people here who have a lot of experience with that. Um, I'll announce the details of that in more detail on Thursday, but just to let you know what's coming up. So you have the, the second paper due on Tuesday the 8th, uh, and then you have the final project, which will be uh, due and presented the very last week of class, so that's April 29th. Uh, any questions? about the assignments. And also note the, the blog uh, prompt just went live uh, on iSites for this week. No further questions? OK. Great. So we're going to talk today about Am I on? Yes. Great. I'm on. Um, so today we're going to talk about this incredibly complicated story of the regulation and deregulation and crash on Wall Street. But I want to start by understanding, are there, are there, are there any like billionaire traders who made their money on Wall Street and then came to Harvard or something like that? Anybody spend time on Wall Street? Are there any experts I can rely on? So I can basically say anything and nobody's going to know whether it's true or not. Right? Um, okay. So um, this is an incredibly important story understood by about 12 people in the world. Um, and so now we're going to multiply that significantly today. And after today, then the world will understand uh, this story. Um, but I want to set it up in a certain way by introducing or maybe reminding you of a very important event that happened on February 19th, 2009. Anybody know what that date is? OK, so maybe you will in a second, so here we go. We want to get to our task force right now. Rick Santelli and Jason Roney of Sharma Capital are standing by at the CME Group in Chicago. And, and Rick, have you been listening to this conversation? Listening to it? I, I've been just glued to it because Mr. Ross has nailed it. You know, the, the government is promoting bad behavior because we certainly don't want to put stimulus for it and give people a whopping 8 or $10 in their check 
and think that they ought to save it. And in terms of modifications, I'll tell you what, I have an idea. You know, the, the new administration's big on computers and technology. How about this, president and new administration? Why don't you put up a website to have people vote on the Internet as a referendum to see if we really want to subsidize the losers' mortgages or would we like to at least buy cars and buy houses in foreclosure and give them to people that might have a chance to actually prosper down the road and reward people that could carry the water instead of drink the water. Hey, Rick, That's did, a novel idea. Hey, hey Rick, did you... What? Who oh, thought of that? Yeah, they're, 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 like putty in, they're like putty in your hands. Did you hear? No, they're not, Joe. They're not like putty in our hands. This is America. How many of you people want to pay for your neighbor's mortgage that has an extra bathroom and can't pay their bills? Raise their hand. How about we all... I, President Obama, are you listening? And How about we all stop paying our mortgage? It's a moral hazard. <laughs> It's like mob roll here. I'm getting scared. I'm glad I'm. I'm glad I'm. A... Don't you guys Don't get, scared, get some Joe. bricks and They're bats. They're already scaring you. You know, Cuba used to have mansions and, and a relatively decent economy. They moved from the individual to the collective. Now they're driving 54 Chevys. Maybe the last great car to come out of Detroit. They're, they're driving them on water too, which is a little strange to watch. Uh, at, there at you time. go. Hey, Rick. How about the notion that? Wilbur pointed out you can go down to two percent on the mortgage. You could go down to minus two percent and still they can't have forty percent and still have forty percent not be able to do it. So why are they in the house? Why are we trying to I keep mean, them I in the house? I know Mr. Summers is a great economist, but boy, I'd love the answer to that one. Jason, Jason, you want to? We're thinking of having a I, Chicago Tea Party in July. <laughs> All you capitalists that want to show up to Lake Michigan, I'm going to start organizing. <laughs> So that was it. That was the birth of the Tea Party. That event began to crystallize a whole bunch of people who were frustrated and angry at what they saw as this collapse that then was bailed out by a Republican administration. And the new administration came in, and they were embracing a whole bunch of other bailout money to make it so that the industry could get through this uh, contagious collapse, by which I mean if they didn't survive that, they would bring down the whole economy. So I want you to just think a little bit about the rhetoric here. Do we want to bail out the losers? Bail out the losers. As we map the path to this collapse, and I want to think about that um, in a particular way. Throughout the story we're going to walk through here, you're going to be searching for a certain kind of gap. We'll be searching for the gap between the public and private incentives. So an entity or an individual will have certain private incentives. And the question you're asking yourself is, what if they act on that private incentives? Is that consistent with the public's good as well? All right. Now we're going to do this by basically starting at the highest level possible. So let's say you're flying at 50,000 feet and you're looking at this problem, what is the problem you see? The answer is you see this. So this is the Case-Shiller Home Price Index. And it basically, if you had gone, if you started in 1990, the, number, the line would be somewhere around here. And what that's demonstrating is there's this period of time where the prices of homes are rising dramatically, and then they're not. So they're going up, and then they're not. And, it's, and then they're not, that triggers this financial collapse. Right? So here's the highest level, prices begin to fall. But that should lead to, let's go down a little bit here, second kind of question, well why would the falling prices trigger this collapse? And there's a certain chain in this story the chain goes something like this. You've got a person who wants to buy a house and gets a mortgage. And it's making an assumption that uh, the price of that house is going to continue to rise. But when the prices didn't rise, then these people went into default. And so you could say, if we're going to identify who's to blame for the catastrophe, you could say with Rick Santelli 
that in the dock, meaning the people are, we're going to be prosecuting here, we could place the borrowers, those borrowers who got a new bathroom or redid their living room, who now have an extra room on their house that they can't pay for, those losers are the ones who are responsible for the collapse. Right. Now, is there anything about that story so far that's kind of puzzling? You're getting a mortgage, you're assuming the prices of housing continues to rise. When prices don't go up, you go into default. What's weird about that story? Banks are supposed to be, right? There's obviously a lot of cases in which they're not. But what's weird about this is in the old-fashioned sense of a mortgage, why should the value of the house matter? Right? Right, you, you shook your head with confidence. Tell me what you... Right, the ordinary mortgage was something you get a 30-year mortgage. You pay a certain fixed amount every month. The price of the house goes up or down, doesn't matter. You still are paying the fixed amount. And so when you borrowed the money, um, you kind of knew how much you owed, and you were going to be paying that amount each time around. So what was it that was going on here? Why were these in default? All right, so let's go down another 5,000 feet here. The answer is <coughs> what, what banks began to offer was a new type of mortgage. New type of mortgage. So a floating interest rate mortgage or a teaser mortgage or something began to be known as a liar loan. So the floating rate more interest mortgage would be, okay, you're paying a certain amount, but that can go up or down depending on what the interest rates do. So you're not sure exactly how much you're going to pay. And if interest rates go up, then you might be paying more and you might not be able to afford it. But interest rates didn't go up dramatically in this period, so that's really not what happened. More um, important were these teaser rate mortgages. So a teaser rate mortgage was, okay, you're gonna pay 0% for two years, and then you're gonna pay 10%. And people would take it out for two years, and then they would have to pay 10%. Or the liar mortgages would basically were mortgages where you didn't have to provide any evidence that you had any money or you had a job. You didn't have to do it. You just had to say, yes, I can pay this back, and they loaned you a half a million dollars. And obviously, a lot of those people um, who borrowed under those circumstances couldn't pay it back, uh, and so therefore their mortgages went bad. Um, but, these, but these still beg this important question. Why were individuals being so risky in this marketplace? Like, why would you put yourself in a place where you're going to have 0% interest for two years and then pay 10%? Yeah. Because we assume that if your house uh, value is going up that much, that it's like a safety Right. OK, there are two things that are going on. Um, the first thing is these offers were incredibly complex. Um, when uh, th these were all happening, um, you know, beginning in the 1990s. And I remember, you know, I teach contract law at the law school. So I remember getting one of these and thinking, oh, this would be fun. I, I, I'll, I'll study this, this offer for a special kind of mortgage, and then we'll teach it in my contract law class. Um, so I sat down with this offer, and I literally spent two hours trying to understand what was being offered to me. Now, it might be that Contracts professors at the Harvard Law School are stupid people, might be, but I could not begin to understand what was being offered. I didn't understand how this was working. I thought, I think, I would assert that literally it was me what was being said to me was meaningless. Um, and so the assumption would be that there were many people out there who would take these loans and they would not know what exactly they were getting into. That's, that's number one, complexity. But number two, Incredible optimism by the consumers that their house prices would continue to rise. So what that optimism translates into is when my teaser rate expires, I'll just call up my mortgage broker 
my buddy, you know, he comes to my house, he says, look, let me give you a new mortgage. So we'll call him up, we'll have another drink, he'll give me a new mortgage, so I'll get another two years at 0% and 10%. This is just the way things will be and I'll have this perpetual cycle of great mortgage rates. And all of that makes perfect sense until, remember the Schiller, case Schiller curve, until housing prices begin to fall and all of a sudden you don't have a way out. So Rick Santelli would say those stupid borrowers, they thought the prices were going up forever, but they were wrong, those idiots. And so therefore, they are to blame. But what's puzzling about that argument here? Yeah. There weren't that many of these so-called idiots in other housing crisis, like the late 80s or something? There weren't that many idiots? What do you mean? It's like because like this kind of problem is something that is like somewhat modern compared to other recessions that we've had before. It's modern, right. But then the question is what's explaining its difference? Right? So here you've got people um, who are borrowing this money. Are, are, are they like this? Who's, who's that? This is Jesse James, not J-E-S-S-I-E -S -S -E James, but J-E-S-S-E -S -S -E James. This is Jesse James. Um, bank robber. Are the people taking out mortgages bank robbers? No, they're not stealing the money, right? What they are doing is borrowing the money. So give me a sense about what the nature of a loan transaction looks like. On the one side, you've got people borrowing. What about on the other side? Lending, okay. People are borrowing and people are lending. So if the borrower is, quote, stupid, because the borrower is assuming prices are going up, what would you say about the lender? Just as stupid too, right? The lender and the borrower are both making this assumption um, that the prices are going to continue to go up. The lender and the borrower are going to make this assumption, and then it turns out it's no longer true, and so the borrower can't pay, and the lender doesn't get its money back. But the first point to recognize is, well, now, is it really the borrower's fault or exclusively the borrower's fault? Or between the borrowers and the lenders, who do you think would be in a better position to know what's likely to happen with housing prices? The lenders. That's their business. So this raises another puzzle. Why is it the lenders all of a sudden got so bad at their business of loaning money? So here we have to descend again. This is cute the way I do this descending, right? Okay. <laughs> so let's think about the way mortgages work. For most of the history of mortgages, this is what a mortgage looked like. It was potted. What does that mean? What do I mean by that? No bankers? It was potted in the sense that you borrowed money to, mortgage, to buy your house from a bank that was local. The bank held the mortgage. You paid that bank back. The bank knew you. The bank was interested in making sure you paid it back because if you didn't pay it back, the bank lost. So in that world, the bank has a very strong incentive to make sure you're the sort of person who can pay this mortgage back and a very strong incentive to make sure you are uh, buying a house you can afford. So they're going to want to make sure you actually got the income you say you've got. They're going to want to make sure that the house is actually worth as much as it said it's going to work be worth, if they have this kind of teaser thing, they want to make sure that you can absorb the 10% interest rate or something like that. They're invested in making sure you can pay the mortgage back. But during this period of time when this mortgage thing begins to blow up, the nature of mortgages changes. And they change in the sense that JP Morgan figures out how to make it so banks can sell mortgages. So basically, the bank issues the mortgage, or a mortgage broker, more likely, issues the mortgage, and then sells it. 
So before, what the bank had was this asset. They were getting paid every month by you for this mortgage. But after this change, they would sell the mortgage to somebody else. And they would get a certain amount of money. So if you've done any finance, you know they get something like the, pre the net present value of that payment, assuming some risk of not repayment, assuming some interest rate. But they get a certain chunk of money from the person who buys the mortgage from you, from them. And then that person will collect your payments going forward. So the banks issue mortgages, and then they sell them away. Um, they don't hold the mortgages anymore. The mortgages are not potted. All right, well, how is that going to change the incentives of the people issuing the mortgages? They're going to issue as many as they can. The money they make is from the transaction of issuing. They're going to be less concerned that the mortgage gets paid back because um, once they sell the mortgage, they're not going to be traced by anybody to cough up the money. The mortgage isn't paid back. The people who buy the mortgage then go and sue the person who has the house. That's what the mortgage is about. The house is the security for the loan. So here's a change in the business model that creates this split between what we can think of as private incentives and public incentives. Because you change the business model, you have this business model where you're selling off mortgages, it's no longer in the incentives of the banks to be, make, to be certain that the buyers of the, I'm, I'm sorry, that the people taking out the mortgage can pay, so the banks are willing to issue more risky mortgages than they otherwise would have been willing to do if the banks themselves paid the price of mortgages that were too risky. Yeah. Right. So, two things happen here. The first thing that happens is nobody is thinking through the way in which the incentives are changing. So initially, um, so initially, they're just assuming everybody's doing the same thing that they've always done. And they were basically doing the same thing they've always done because they were issuing prime mortgages, meaning they're issuing mortgages to people who were creditworthy and there was, but as that market dries up, people begin to push to subprime mortgages. This is mortgages to people who are below standard credit worthiness or more risky mortgages. And new businesses start up that, that are just focused on the issue, the idea of issuing mortgages. So companies, countries like, companies like Countrywide in California, which gets started to be mortgage broker, um, you know, and they sell themselves as, we're just trying to deliver the American dream to as many people as we possibly can. They go out there and they push these mortgages like this. And nobody's really understanding initially how different the standards are. And you don't really discover it until all of a sudden all these mortgages start going bad. So it, it's kind of late where they discover it. And the second reason I'm going to bracket for a second because it's kind of technical and interesting as we relate to something later on. But let me just hold for the second reason. But, but you would think if all things were perfect, the buyer of the mortgages would make sure the seller actually issued the mortgage in the right way, but there are reasons why that just didn't happen. But here's the first thing then, that the gap between the incentives of the banks and what made sense from the public's perspective grows. And so then when you ask the questions, who's in the dock, you could say the borrowers who borrowed when they couldn't pay back, they're responsible. But you also want to say, the people who built this mortgage, and we're going to talk about CDOs, CDOs in a second, but this mortgage market, who began to build this market where there was a separation between the people who issued the mortgages and the people who bought them, they too were responsible for increasing the risk in this market and therefore making it more likely that it would crash. Okay, now, what would the defense be? Say so you're representing the industry that creates this new way of issuing mortgages. What would you say in its defense? The 
banks were just as dumb as the borrowers. Okay, that's a defense, not the strongest maybe because it's kind of embarrassing to admit you as a banker that's dumb as the borrowers, okay? But that is certainly the first defense you're going to push. Number two? Okay, this is the thing I didn't want to tell her, so now you tell her, okay? <laughs> Okay, so I'm going to put this into a black box and we're going to come back to the black box. But the basic argument here is there was a theory out there that when these mortgages were being sold off, they were being packaged in a way that reduced the net risk so that even if they were more risky in parts, they were on balance going to be less risky in the bundle. So it wasn't actually making the world a more risky place. Um, this turns out to be just wrong. <laughs> but for a long time, people you know, believed it because it paid a lot to believe it. So they believe that they continue to run with it and therefore they continue to push this market like that. So that's number two. And number three, yeah. Sorry, couldn't hear you. Wasn't technically illegal and this is capitalism, right? You're not no doubt breaking the law. Um, you're just making as much. So I have a different way to make money. Now, it turns out there was a lot of fraud here, which is technically illegal, just to be clear about that. I, you know, you're not <laughs> lawyers, but okay. Um, but forgetting the technically illegal, they're just trying to figure out the best way to bundle things to make people get what they can the most and make the most money from it. That's what they're doing, right? Certainly. Um, what's the other big defense? I kind of signaled it before. Yeah. Um, possibly that no one could predict that the housing market would come. That's where we started. Okay, we started with we didn't know that the housing market was going to collapse. Okay, but so that's number one. That's absolutely what everybody said over and over again. But you can say you can sell whatever you want, but no one's going to be dumb enough to buy it, hypothetically? Well, okay, and this is a little bit of the defense of it's not illegal. It's like, look, these are, you know, rational actors. They make a choice. They choose to act in a certain way. If they buy it, they buy it because they think it's worth it to them. So why, why are you going to try to take away from them the freedom to engage in that kind of transaction? But the final thing, which is a big... Um, which is a big bugaboo in the kind of Tea Party world, is that it was a very strong governmental policy to get people to buy houses. There was a government-sponsored enterprise, a GSE called Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. These were government entities that were in the business of trying to make it easier for people to be able to get out, get mortgages on their houses. They would guarantee mortgages in a certain way. Um, there was a big push by uh, all sorts of people in Congress, including our local Barney Frank, to make it so everybody could have a house. So this was the general objective of the policy around housing, that we find ways to make it easier for people to buy houses. And that's what these guys are doing. They're like, we're making it easier for people to buy houses. We've created this huge market that facilitates mortgages being issued. And therefore, more people have mortgages, more people will be able to live in a house that they actually own. The American dream will be realized. Ask George Bush. That was his idea. Okay, so that was a defense. I don't know if you're going to buy it, but okay, let's step down a little bit more. Um, okay, now this is getting tiring, this way this works, but all right. Um, uh, and let's look a little bit more into exactly this point about uh, how this was working on Wall Street. So J.P. Morgan turns out to be the really ingenious house figuring out how to build the whole structure that when it collapsed brings down the whole world. Okay, so here's basically how it works. So imagine you've got a house and it has a mortgage. And imagine you bundle these mortgages together. Um, and you bundle them together and you sell the right to the bundle in what's called a mortgage-backed security. So security, you know, anything like a stock can be a security. It's a thing that has a certain value or issues a certain value. A bond is a security. It issues a certain amount of money every period. These securities are backed by mortgages. As was suggested in the, I'm sorry, your name is? Chris. As Chris was suggesting, it's, it's more complicated than I'm going to describe it here because the complexity is not really necessary. But these mortgages were sliced up in different ways and bundled in different ways, but that's beyond what we need to worry about. They're bundled together and you've got something called a mortgage-backed security. And then these mortgage-backed securities are in a sense bundled together 
And that produces um, um, a collateralized uh, debt obligation CDO. So the CDOs are one step away from the actual houses. So here are houses. They produce mortgages. Mortgages produce mortgage-backed securities. The securities get bundled and sold into something called these CDOs. And the CDOs, this is where we're going to split them up. So by this, I just mean we cut them up into parts. And the issuers of the CDOs would do something like this. They would maybe hold one part or a tranche, as would be described. So the highest, usually the issuer would hold the highest, lowest risk part and sell the other parts off into the market. And the market would then want to make sure that the bet of this security would be covered or hedged. So they bought something called credit default swaps. These are derivatives. Okay, so technically all a derivative means is something whose price is determined based on something else. So I could issue a derivatives contract that says I will pay you a dollar for every degree above zero the temperature is on every day between now and June. That's a derivative because the amount that it's worth is derived from the actual temperature in Cambridge on each of these days. Um, the, this derivative, um, these credit default swaps, were pegged to the values of the C CDOs so that if the value of the CDO went down, this credit default swap was like an insurance contract. It would say, okay, we'll pay you if the value of it goes down beyond a certain level. So that you as a bank can say, okay, I've got this asset, but I want to hedge to make sure it doesn't blow up or become worthless, so I'll buy this insurance policy, and this insurance policy will cover me if this actually turns out to be not as valuable as I thought it would be. So I'm getting a tiny spread between the cost of the insurance policy and the return here, but that spread turned out to be pretty valuable. So they were happy to engage in that kind of transaction. And it's not just the issuer who would, issue, who would um, buy these credit default swaps, these derivatives. Everybody brought these derivatives. Um, and then, of course, the people issuing these derivatives were entities like a company called AIG, and we know what happened to AIG. AIG blew up, or at least their credit default swap derivatives, part of their business blew up. They also were an insurance company that didn't blow up, but that blew up. Um, and it blew up in part because even though these CDSs, credit default swaps, were essentially insurance contracts, they were not regulated as insurance contracts, meaning Whereas with an insurance contract, the law requires you set aside a certain amount of money to cover the losses. So if you have an insurance contract insuring a house against being burned down, the law will require you've got to set aside a certain amount of money to make sure that you can cover the loss if, in fact, houses burn down. These were exempted. So AIG was not putting aside anything more than a couple hundred million dollars to cover billions and billions in these credit default swaps. So when these things started blowing up, AIG didn't have anything. AIG turned to the government and said, we don't have anything, the world's gonna blow up, and the government stepped up and helped them. Okay, so, so this increasing complexity has one more layer, and then we're gonna pause and just think a little bit about what this complexity means. So remember, we have mortgages, mortgage-backed securities, CDOs. All those were in some sense tied to real things in the world. In the sense that there's real houses. We're not talking about Minecraft. There are like real houses out there. <laughs> and you have real mortgages, people going out and buying houses and getting a mortgage for them. And those mortgages are really transferred to people who set up mortgage-backed securities. And the securities are really things like bonds, which are in paper or electronic, and they are actually located in some physical place. And the CDOs are really based on those real assets. By about 2006, as houses pricing were beginning to fall, Wall Street began to say, our market's drying up. There's not enough mortgages being issued anymore for us. 
we have this huge growing industry based on all this kind of complexity we put on top, but it's slowing down because we don't have anything more to be issuing things on top of. Because there are just so many houses, because there is just so much land, and because again, we're not in virtual worlds like Minecraft. So they began to say, we need to think of a new kind of product we can sell. And what was the new product they sold? Something called synthetic CDOs, which sounds just as gross as it is. So what synthetic CDOs were, were collateralized debt obligations, CDOs, but based not on real anything. They were just based on derivatives, bets on bets, bets on bets. So you could buy insurance or make a bet on any other transact, any other thing going on in this marketplace without any limit. So the synthetic CDO market became another market people were buying on top of the underlying security CDO market they were buying. So people were buying and buying and buying and selling and selling and selling. The transaction got more and more explosive and um, people are making huge amounts and eventually will lose huge amounts as they are on the right or the wrong side of those bets. It's a huge gambling market. It is literally gambling. I mean, it is literally bets. Okay. Now, Here's the puzzle to it. There are two puzzles to it. One is, um, if you wanted to insure my house against fire, and you went to an insurance company and said, I'd like to insure Lessig's house against fire, what would the insurance company say to you? You would say yes? Uh, no, and you're probably an arson. Yeah. You would say, why are you interested in insuring Lessig's <laughs> house against uh, arson? <laughs> um, I'm a little skeptical of what you're doing here. And so the answer is no, you can't because the law has a very strong principle, which is you have no insurable interest in my house. I have an insurable interest in my house. I can insure my house, but you can't. But with these, CD, with these synthetic CDOs, here's the way they would work. You'd have a, CD, a synthetic CDO that would say, I bet that this non-synthetic CDO will go up by 2% um, or make it more like insurance. You have to pay me if this non-synthetic CDO goes down by 2%. So that's like insurance. That's like my house burns down. But the difference between the synthetic CDOs or the CDOs and the housing is that there's no regulation that requires you have an insurable interest. So I could buy Insurance, you could buy insurance, she could buy insurance, everybody could be buying insurance on the same transaction. There's just the question of how many bets people are willing to make. It becomes like a fantasy football game or it becomes like bets on the Super Bowl. The only question is just how many people are there out there willing to make bets, not do you have the right to be making a bet on this particular um, transaction. So the number of such transactions explodes, all sorts of transactions out there that are um, in this market of synthetic CDOs. Um, and the second weird part of this is nobody knows who owns what. Because there's no, this, these complex transactions in the derivatives market do not at this time have to be reported to anybody. They're all over the counter transactions which means nobody knows what the exposure is. The Treasury Department has no idea what the exposure is. The Fed has no idea what the exposure is. Nobody knows what's actually out there. And so when these markets explode and get extremely big with all these bets on bets, there's nobody who can actually calculate what would happen when things begin to collapse. So this hugely complex market evolves to cut up and produce ways to allocate risk through these derivatives and underlying mortgage applications. Yeah. So with all these like bets and synthetic CDOs and stuff like that, there's hypothetically like a winner and a loser, right? So I, ideally this should like balance out in an economy. So it's the bigger issue is just more just, just complexity that nobody knew like who was who I won and who was the winner and who was the loser, or was it was there actually something about the fact that there's lots of people losing money? 
wealth to make money that made you some better CEO than the current one? Well, the critical problem was there were certain people that began to be accumulators of this risk. So AIG, for example. So when all of a sudden things start going bad and AIG has no reserves to cover the bad bets, AIG is threatened with extinction. And the fear is if AIG goes down, it brings down a huge chunk of the economy which led the government to run in and give them $80 billion <laughs> to save them in that sense. So um, And the second part related to what I said about transparency is once this starts unraveling and people are screaming bloody murder, this is all falling apart, somebody like you could make your very accurate theoretical point. Look, they're just winners and losers. We'll cancel it out. But other people might say, well, well how is it going to affect the economy? What's the contagious effect on the economy? And because we don't know who's holding what, because we have no way to even measure it or, no, or begin to model it, it creates huge terror, which is what in fact it did in September of 2008, which was when this whole thing collapsed. So it's this hugely complex set of obligations which nobody could manage. And nobody really understood. Um, this is the part that's kind of impossible to believe, but so here's, here's, here's a little bit of the story. Um, as you know, financial wizards are producing all these new ways to do things, and they seem to be making money, Wall Street sucks them up and deploys them. Long before anybody's really figured out whether the theory is true. This is the best example of it, this guy David X. Lee. If this, this story is the sort of story that if it were like during the Cold War, you would have a different set of expectations about it. But David X. Lee's um, comes from, I can't remember if it's mainland China or Taiwan, but he's one of these two. He emigrates to Canada. He invents this thing called the Gaussian uh, Coppola. What the Gaussian Coppola does is provide a simple way to price these very complex derivatives. Before the Gaussian Coppola is produced, the banks didn't produce these very complex derivatives because nobody knew how to price them. And if you begin to think, it's not hard to see why it's hard to price them because if the derivatives, if the, just think the CDOs, the CDOs are made up of mortgage-backed securities which are made up of mortgages. If you're gonna price them, you need to, in theory, you'd think, understand all the mortgage prices and then how they are being mixed together to produce the mortgage-backed securities and then mixed together to produce the CDOs. But you don't know any of that certainly don't know what the underlying mortgages are, so people th thought you couldn't price these things. He comes along with this formula that says, turns out you can price these things. And so he demonstrates it. Certain banks start using it. Everybody starts using it. It sweeps the country. They start releasing software that uses it. And then after everybody is using it, turns out it's wrong. <laughs> and David Lee goes back to China. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and if this is the 1970s, he would have gotten the Order of Lenin. You know, it's like, it's like, wh why was he here? What was he doing? It's like he drops in, and he spreads this virus, this financial virus that everybody embraces. Then it turns out it's wrong, and it blows up the market. You know, so but nobody had time to figure that out because everybody's making so much money. They're racing out there, making as much money as they can. Um, the second way in which this becomes too. Uh, Complex. This is a wonderful story told by Patterson, the quants. Um, there's, this, there's this story about the Great Crash. goes something like this. It's actually George Bush who's responsible for the Great Crash. And the reason for that is he, turns, he, he shuts down uh, an accelerator project, a particle accelerator project in Texas. Shuts it down. And all the genius mathematicians who were going to work on that no longer have a job. So they go to Wall Street and they start using their genius physics, mathematics, mathematics, working on financial problems rather than working on problems of particle acceleration. Now, they don't know squat about mortgages or about supply and demand or anything. They don't think about it from the perspective of what's the thing we're modeling, what's the real thing they're modeling. They think about it from the perspective of these are numbers, these are patterns, these are relationships, these are probabilities. 
That's what we deal with. We deal with particle accelerators. So we can do that stuff. Um, and as you think about, you know, going from mortgages to mortgage-backed securities to CDOs to synthetics, further and further away from anything real, it's not implausible that you no longer have to understand anything about the underlying stuff. You just have to understand things about the things on the surface. So they begin modeling and building these hugely complex systems without any understanding of the underlying economy. And worse, their managers don't understand what they're doing. <laughs> You know, the managers can't begin. Remember, I made that really terrible slander on like Wall Street people from the 1970s. You know, the guys who got like C's in, uh, in the days when there were C's in Harvard and like were just decent kind of frat boy like guys. Um, well, all of a sudden they're running these, you know, they're supposed to be supervisors for these geniuses. <laughs> and they don't know what they're doing. All they know is what they're doing is producing lots of money. It's like they open up the door and money is being printed in those <laughs> offices. So they just <laughs> shut the door and say, I don't want to know what's going on here and let them go and they race. And there's a kind of dynamic which um, kind of suggests to me this, uh, um, you think about the way it works. We have this, we have this development called computers and I, this is an old computer but I mean this really because when these old computers get introduced onto Wall Street, all of a sudden you can do things you couldn't do before. And very quickly, when you get into the quant days, you're doing things that are wildly beyond what anybody has the capacity to understand. And it evokes this old film. Does anybody, anybody ever see this? So this is called the Forbin Project. So the idea of the Forbin Project is this president, I'm sorry, this scientist, Forbin, develops this computer, this really genius computer. And the president decides that he wants that computer to decide whether and when to launch nuclear strike. Because the president says, this is too hard for me to figure out, and I don't want to make that judgment, so I'll have the computer do it. So Forbin builds the computer. The Defense Department turns control of the nuclear launch codes over to the computer, and they make this big announcement that the world is safe now that the computer is making the decision. And then it turns out the Russians have done the same thing. So there are two computers. There's Colossus and, I can't remember the name of the other one. Okay, well there's the Russian one and then there's Colossus. Okay. So then, in the critical part of the movie, this is what happens. Status. Discover they exist, each of them learns the other one's there. Guardian and Colossus, yeah. Oh, well, there it is. There's the common basis for communication. A new language. An intersystem language. The computers start talking to each other. But a language only those machines can understand. Yeah, the language only the machines can understand. There's Forbin. He realizes they're, can I say this, fucked. <laughs> Why? Because the machines get together and they start saying, hey, these idiot humans, they're causing so much trouble in the world. There's starvation, there's poverty, all this sort of stuff. We're going to teach them how to run, a, run the world. And the computers tell the humans that they work for the computers and they start dropping bombs to sort of discipline the humans into behaving right. But the point, the whole, you know, the point of the metaphor is, they turn these decisions over to the computers. They no longer understand or can control the computers, and the computers eventually bring them down. Well, that's kind of the story of what happened with the quants on Wall Street. We turned all this over to the computers, didn't really understand how to manage what the computers were doing. The computers went out of control, and they brought the economy down. Right? And you know, the temptation at every stage is obvious. The president's just trying to make a safer world by handing it over to the computer. Um, but the net result of this is we build systems we can't control. So this is the Wall Street in the dock. You say, okay, who's responsible? Rick Santelli? Borrowers to a certain extent. The people who changed the way the lending business was to a certain extent. But Wall Street, for building this hugely complicated mass of risk allocation, which turned out not to be 
um, reducing risk in the world, but increasing risk in the world, making the world much more vulnerable to this destruction. And the defense Wall Street might have is the same defense we saw for the mortgage people. Number one, they didn't think anything would ever go bad. What could possibly go wrong, was what they said. Number two, um, uh, they were not doing anything illegal. Turns out they probably were, but okay, they were not doing anything illegal. And number three, they were giving what the market wanted. The market wanted ways to allocate all this kind of risk, especially because people in the market, people on Wall Street, found all these cool new ways to make tons of money as they were selling these products that were reallocating risk like this. Okay, so um, there are questions here before we go to the next step? Before we descend another 5,000 feet? Yeah. So a documentary like Inside Job that kind of characterizes the history of the institutional and global present predatory subprime loans, where does that fit into the story? Yeah, so great question. How many people saw that great movie? Great. Okay, some. Mm. Maybe we should have assigned you this movie. Um, we got in, would have gotten in trouble with colleagues on the Harvard faculty, but okay. Um, uh, so this is the tension between the way this course wants to think about these problems and the way the world, the way the dramatic world wants to think about problems. Right? So remember the very beginning, we were talking about Congress. And I said, there are all those people out there who want to say that Congress is filled with criminals, really bad people, just trying to steal us blind. If you look at people like um, uh, Schweitzer has a book called Extortion, which is about his claim that Congress is basically engaged in extortion. So this is like intentional wrongs wrought by bad people. And my account was, actually, you don't have to assume that they're bad people. You don't have to assume that there's intentional wrongs. You can understand how they're doing all these bad things without actually intending to do bad. And that's the same thing that's going on here. There's one account. Um, which, uh, which is that Wall Street is filled with people who are just trying to screw everybody and get as much money as they could. Right? And there are a lot of great books in that, in that line. Um, and great quotes from emails where they talk about how they're just going to rip the face off their customers. Like this is what you're trying to do is rip the face off the customers. Get as much as you possibly can. Um, and, uh, and that's, I think, you know, part of the story. But what I'm trying to emphasize is you don't need to assume that there's a whole bunch of bad people here in order to explain the dynamic that we saw leading to this collapse. You can assume there are a bunch of people who are just trying to do the thing they're supposed to be doing, which is maximizing revenue or maximizing wealth and the constraints of the market as they find it. Um, and so um, it might be that there were bad people like that, Certainly, Charlie Ferguson, the director of Inside Job, believes that there were. But it could also be that there are people who are just you know, taking each logical step down the road of producing more and more products that have this consequence, never really intending to produce the explosion that was the final destruction, but ultimately doing it because there's a mismatch between their incentives and the incentives of the public. That's the approach of this course that we're trying to, to bring out here. Yes, I do. And the reason for that, I think this is in the reading. Um, if it's not, we should. I th no, I think it, it is in the reading. If you look at the timing um, and you look at the actual loans that go bad, the GSE loans, the <laughs> Frannie, Ma Frannie uh, and Freddie Mac loans, Frannie Mae, Freddie Mac loans, turn out not to be the loans that go bad. All of the securitization that eventually goes bad is Wall Street securitization. So as Posner sort of argued in his books, Nobody was forcing Wall Street to get into this business. It wasn't like the government was saying, you must go and issue these securities <coughs> or back up these mortgages with these securities. It just turned out to be an incredibly profitable thing for them to do, so they did it. And those turned out to be the securities which were the high failure securities. 
So if they, so the claim is if Wall Street hadn't done that, Fannie and Freddie were already backing away from a significant, from the big chunk of the risky mortgages here. And there's a scenario where nothing would have ever blown up, even though there was this big role they were playing in trying to expand the mortgage horizon. Um, so, the, but for my purposes, even if that's wrong, it's not going to matter to the ultimate punchline because why are they in that position? Well, we'll see why that's connected in a minute. But okay. you had your hand up back here? Yeah. Uh, possibly a stupid question. But how was this business so profitable if the selling of, say, uh, um, metropolitan swaps is in some sense a zero-sum game? Not quite a zero-sum game because uh, um, you're paying something for the insurance, but the insurance is not sucking up the full value of the um, trade. And the reason it's not sucking up the full value is the expectation of those that were selling the insurance, goes back to the claim that was being made before, was that this securitization was actually reducing the risk of the underlying assets. So if you believe that by carving it up and creating this portfolio of risk as opposed to individual risk, you are actually reducing risk, then you could buy insurance more cheaply on the aggregate than you could on the individual. So that means there would be some spread that you would be getting and actually making money. So that turned out to be why it was. There's another chunk of this reason, which is the derivatives market is a cartel. It's not an open competitive market. There are basically just a couple people who are allowed to play in it. And it was so complicated that the people they were selling derivatives to didn't know enough to be able to evaluate whether the prices are fair. So they were able to get, this is the passages that you can point to in like Frank Partnoy's books, passages about ripping the faces off our clients. The people who were actually in that business knew that they could take advantage of their clients and charge them things that were not actually related to the underlying risk because the clients had no way to evaluate. I mean, how could you evaluate when it was all this complexity? So that created, again, a very high spread which they then could minimize a certain, they thought they could minimize a certain amount of the risk by selling or buying the CD uh, credit default swaps against those expo that exposure. Yeah. Uh, on the CEOs, you mentioned that uh, the banks held one portion of it. Uh, was that the highest risk or the lowest risk? risk? Lowest risk. Yeah. Lowest risk. And then it turned out that it was, well, for the reason we're going to get to in a second, it turned out it was much more risky than they thought it was. Yeah. Uh, was there a regulatory change that made it possible yeah. for banks to hold We're going to hold higher? this. We're going to hold this. Hold this for a second. Okay, um, more questions before we go on? Great question, that's the ultimate punchline. All right, so the next stage. We, declined, we, we, decline, uh, we descend to the darkness of credit rating agencies. So credit rating, rating agencies are famously powerful. Thomas Friedman in 1996 writes, there are two superpowers in the world today. There's the United States and there's Moody's Bond Rating Service. <laughs> the United States can destroy you by dropping bombs and Moody's can destroy you by downgrading your bonds. And believe me, it's not clear sometimes who's more powerful. Because of course, if the United States drops a bomb on you, there's a lot of trouble the United States is gonna face. But if Moody's downgrades you, it could be just as destructive, but nobody's gonna come and punish Moody's for downgrading you, right? So these, this is a very important point about the regulatory power of this market actor. Um, but as the Financial Crisis Inquiry Commission um, okay, uh, says, and this, we went through th some of these slides in the first se for second lecture we did, the failures of the credit rating agencies were essential cogs in the, the wheel of financial destruction. And you should understand this a little bit more now. That's because of a change in business model. So how did, how did business, what was the business model of credit rating agencies originally? Yeah, they were subscribers, right? So you would subscribe, you would get mailed to you a newsletter. The newsletter would say, this bond is a triple A, this bond's a double A. And in a world where it's hard to share information, it's a pretty good business model because you could charge a lot for the subscriptions and the people who want to use this are willing to pay a lot because this is important information. But you know, long before there was Napster for music, there was Napster for financial information. <laughs> so people who would buy this information would then share it. And so the credit 
rating agencies would be losing because some of their revenue was being stolen, quote unquote, through the sharing of this information contrary to the subscriptions. So that led them to try to think, well, what's a different business model for us? Because this old business model turns out not to be as profitable it was, as it once was, at least in a world where everything we have can be shared so easily. So we see a shift, an evolution of the business model to what's the business model look like now? Right, so now you've got a world where the people who want to issue the bonds go out to the rating agency and they say, we'd like you to rate this bond. And the rating agency says, okay, here's what we will charge, but we will only charge it if we rate the bond. And they say, okay, well, what are you going to rate it at? And they say, mm, double A. And the person issuing the bond says, no, nope, we want AAA. And so they say, we'll go someplace else. Because it turns out there's not just one rating agency. There are three main ra rating agencies. Three or four, I can't remember. Three, three main three. rating agencies. And these rating agencies have their status as quasi-regulators because the regulators decided they needed some market-based measure of the <coughs> worth of a security. So the regulators, the SEC, basically set up the system where these grandfathered rating agencies had the ability to determine what investment grade assets were and a whole bunch of entities like governments or pension plans were not allowed to do anything with any kind of asset that wasn't investment rated at a certain level. So these private agencies became an effective, in effect, public regulators. And so what's the obvious problem with that? Well, as the Financial Crisis Inquiry Commission puts it, because issuers could choose which rating agency to do business with, because the agencies depended on their issuers for revenues, rating agencies felt pressured to give favorable ratings so they might remain competitive. I showed you um, Johnson and Quack before. Wall Street said, hey, if you don't give me the rating I want, the guy across the street will, and we'll get them all, and, and we'll give them all the business. And they just played the rating agencies off one another. And then Lowenstein's wonderful, you'll remember this, the um, aiding agencies as three competitive saloons standing side by side with each free to set its own drinking age before long nine-year-olds would be downing bourbon. Right, so the point to recognize from the perspective of what this course is about is all we did was change the incentives and what that produced was an agency that could no longer serve its function. You change the incentives by making it so the agencies are selling their ratings in a competitive market that drives them towards being lax with their ratings. But being lax with your ratings is precisely what a rating agency is not supposed to be. It's supposed to be rating on the basis of the underlying facts of the riskiness here. But it can't, where it doesn't, where there's such incredible competitive pressure as there was here. Um, okay, so the rating agencies might be added to the list of those who are possible defenders here. What's their defense? Well, their number one defense is the same as everybody. It was a bubble. They didn't know it was a bubble. A second defense is these guys were operating way above their pay grade. So if you compared the people who are actually building the bonds, people inside <coughs> Goldman Sachs, to the people running rating agencies, you know, I'm sure they're sweet people, but you know, they're at the rating agencies because they didn't get a job at Goldman Sachs. Right? So, um, you know, the Goldman Sachs guys come in and say, yeah, no, no, we've got these 44,000 different things that we crunch the numbers and it turns out this should be a triple A. And, you know, the people at Moody say, well, I'm not sure. It should look like a double A to me. And the Goldman Sachs say, no, 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 look, you've got an alpha here and blah, blah, blah. So, you know, the point is they are not really in a position to stand up to um, the Goldman Sachs, even if they were able to resist the competitive pressure. Um, and the third defense is a defense which echoes throughout all of these different contexts. And the third defense is, we are in a competitive market. If we don't do it, somebody else will. So we've got to match what the competitors do and competition drives everybody down to the least common denominator. Okay, now the thing about, this is the part that, this is the 
the punchline of what I want to present today. The thing about all of these people to attack <coughs> is there's something incredibly naive about these attacks. So this guy is perhaps the greatest judge of the 20th century. He's still a judge in the 21st century, but his great work, um, mainly in the 20th century, this is Richard Posner, um, a man who uh, has written more than 50 books, kind of writes a book a year. Um, and he's written two books about the financial crisis. He wrote one, then he wrote another, because you know, why write one when you can write two? Um, <laughs> um, and he gives this critique of the Financial Crisis Inquiry Commission report, which you get a good flavor of the Financial Crisis Inquiry Commission report from just the small sections we gave you. And that flavor is along the lines that you were suggesting, a whole bunch of bad guys in Wall Street did a whole bunch of bad things. And Poster responds like this. The emphasis the report places on the folly of private sector actors ignores the possibility that most of them were behaving rationally Given the environment of dangerously low interest rates, complacency about asset price inflation, what bubbles, um, the bubbles that the regulators, with the occasional honorable exception, the, and the economics, the profession ignored, and light and lax regulation. So in the context of light, lax regulation, what he's saying is everything everybody did makes sense. It was the rational thing for them to do. So deregulation here, this conservative judge argues or suggests accounts for the craziness that the market produces. And then he's asked directly, are you saying deregulation destroyed the market? He said, yes. Am I saying deregulation made the bankers and through them the borrowers takes risks that were excesses from an overall social standpoint? Yes. Once we recognize that competition will force banks to taste, take risks in order to increase their return and that the economic and regulatory environments permits them to take um, provided the risks are legal and profit maximizing, whatever their consequences for the economy as a whole. So those banks individually take risks which turn out to be not sensible for the economy as a whole. There's a gap between the private incentives and the public incentives. And that's because, as Poser said, banks do not have regard for the consequences of the economy as a whole because that's not the business of banks. That is the business of government. Um, and then he has this wonderful passage where he's remarking on Alan Greenspan's testimony. And Alan Greenspan said that he was mistaken to believe that the banks would never allow the catastrophe to happen because they would always be interested in acting in the public interest in this context. Those who writes, that was a whopper of a mistake for an economist to make. It was as if the head of the EPA, criticized for not enforcing federal anti-pollution laws, had said he thought the self-interest of the polluters implied that they are best capable of protecting their shareholders and the equity and their equity. They are indeed the best capable of doing that, but the reason for laws regulating pollution is that pollution is an external cost of production, which is to say a cost not borne by the polluting company or shareholders, and in making business decisions, uh, profit maximizers don't consider the cost they don't bear. Banks consider the potential cost of bankruptcy to themselves in deciding how much to take risks how much risk to take on, but do not consider the potential cost to society as a whole. So the claim is these banks are in a position to behave in a way that helps them, but them doesn't, helping them doesn't necessarily mean helping um, uh, the economy as a whole. That's because they are profit maximizers. They had certain agency problems, by which we mean the interest of the corporation wasn't necessarily the interest of the managers in the corporation. There's a gap there. We call that the agency problem. It's a very famous slogan that gets repeated on Wall Street again and again and again. IBG, YBG, which is, you know, you go to a rating agency and you say, come on, give us a triple, bot, a triple A here. A rating agency would say, no, 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 it's not worth a triple, uh, 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 triple A here. And you would say, IBG, YBG, which means by the time this blows up, I'll be gone, you'll be gone. Right? <laughs> we'll have our money. We'll be living in, uh, you know, the Bahamas will be having our happy life and the whole world will have exploded, but we don't need to worry about it. That's an agency problem. Like these guys might have known they were doing things that didn't make sense, but they didn't care about it because they thought they themselves wouldn't suffer on it. But the point is you can't rely, you shouldn't rely on these to do it individually. What you needed was to have some kind of regulation. So that's the 
incredible question, important question. What happened to the regulation here? And the answer is what happened is this happy man, President Bill Clinton. So about the time you were born, there was this guy named Bill Clinton. Uh, um, became president in 93 when he was elected with a plurality. Wall Street was terrified that he was a populist. And uh, the Democratic Party was terrified that they were going to be obliterated by the Republicans who found a new um, passion in attacking Bill Clinton. So Clinton decided it was incredibly important to signal to Wall Street that he could be as pro-Wall Street as the Republicans. And uh, thus begins the tragedy of deregulation, which is the tragedy of derivatives, because over the period of the 90s, Wall Street is coming to Washington and saying, here's what we want. We want to be deregulated. We want you to engage in a series of changes of the law that basically allow us to self-regulate. And nobody said, well, what does Dick Posner think about this? The idea that they could self-regulate became the norm. The idea everybody took for granted. These people should be able to regulate themselves. They're smarter than the regulators. They'll be able to solve this problem all by themselves. So there was a strong push to deregulate. And it happened to pay the political parties to deregulate. Because the more they deregulated, the more money flowed into the campaign coffers of the parties that were deregulated. <clears throat> then there was this crazy radical named Brooks Lee Bourne. She was in charge of the Commodities Future Trading Commission, CFTC. And Brooks Lee Bourne is looking at the rise of derivatives. And she's saying, well, derivatives are a lot like a futures contract. CFTC is charged with regulating futures contracts. So Brooks Lee Bourne issues a white paper from the CFTC to float the idea of increased regulation of derivatives contracts. Maybe we should be regulating derivatives contracts. And not regulating in the sense of saying they're not allowed, but in the sense of, well, maybe they should be transparent. Maybe people should know what's being bought and sold. Maybe there should be a market where they're traded so there's fair pricing. All the sort of thing that apply to stocks and bonds and, and futures contracts. Well, after she said that, there was basically um, a, a huge conflagration in Washington, um, as Lowenstein describes it. Every banker in Washington complained about the upstart CFTC. Following Wall Street's urging, Treasury Secretary Rubin, a former co-chairman of Goldman Sachs, was extremely hostile. A posse of regulators scheduled a meeting for late April for the purpose of persuading Bourne to bury the release. Before the meeting, Larry Summers, Rubin's top deputy at the Treasury Department, called Bourne and berated her. Summers huffed, there are 13 bankers in my office. They say if this is published, we'll have the worst financial crisis since World War II. As he goes on, Alan Greenspan got in Bourne's face. This is in the April meeting, blowing and blustering till he reddened. Treasury Secretary Rubin, always more politics, spoke with controlled fury as if Bourne's proposal were unsuited to his society. He repeated that the CFTC was out of its jurisdiction and asked Bourne, who had been elected president of the Stanford Law Review in 1963, when most of the women in law firms were still pouring coffee, would like an education in the optical law from the Treasury's general counsel. So basically, these guys got together and said, do not even suggest that you're going to regulate derivatives. Well, Brooks Lee Bourne was not going to be pushed around, so she published this notwithstanding which led to this incredible fight where Greenspan, Summers, and Rubin announced that they were going to stop their own administration person from doing what she was doing inside of the administration. And that led to um, a special committee being, produced, uh, being formed, which in November of 99 said to promote innovation, competition, efficiency, and transparency in OTC transaction, derivatives markets, over-the-counter derivatives markets, to reduce systemic risk, the great faith that um, we were pointing to before, and to allow the United States to maintain leadership in these rapidly developing markets, derivatives should be exempted from all federal regulation. 
And in 2000, one of the last statutes that um, Bill Clinton signed as president, he passed a law which banned the CFTC from regulating derivatives, thereby throwing derivatives into a completely unregulated market, which is the final descent of our airplane into disaster. Right there, okay. <laughs> okay, so in the dock, added to these private actors is this public actor, the regulators. Because the point Posner is making is the regulators should have realized that these private actors would never have sufficient incentive to protect the public against the systemic risk that their behavior would create, just like coal companies don't have a sufficient incentive to avoid the pollution that their coal will produce. So that's the job of regulators. What's the defense of regulators? Well, the defense is the policymakers, the lawmakers, were very eager to keep Wall Street happy because that kept Wall Street happy with the political parties, which was necessary to fund their behavior. Um, but then this one more final little exchange here. After this all happened, Jamie Dimon at a uh, Davos conference makes the following statement. God knows some really stupid things were done by American bankers and American investment bankers. Some stupid things were done, but it wasn't just the bankers. Where were the regulators in all this? And then some of the people at JP Morgan who created the original instruments that began the things that blew up said, it wasn't our job to stop other banks being so stupid. What about the regulators? Where were they? Now, if you've ever wondered what the word chutzpah means, <laughs> That's chutzpah. Because after these guys had basically paid to force the, the regulators to leave the field and then leave the field to destruction, to turn around and say the problem here is that the regulators weren't on the field to protect, uh, protect us against our own behavior is just about as outrageous as it can be. But that's the end of what I want to say. If there are questions about this, we can take them. Otherwise, we can stop. Yes. So there's a series of SEC changes, all under the theory that the banks are in the best position to know what they should do, and that's what they, that's what they do. Any other questions? Yes, sir. So you didn't mention anything about like, shadow banking or like, the retail markets, and that's like a whole other topic of the Anchorage Commission. Like, how important was that role to all of the disruption in the financial industry? Like, I think each of those plays a significant role. But the dynamic from the perspective of what we're interested in is basically the same. So you have markets racing according to what makes sense to the markets. And the answer, and the point is, that's what you expect them to do. We hire them to be trying to make money. But the regulators don't constrain them in a way that avoids this unnecessary public risk, and that produces the ultimate collapse. Okay, other questions? Great, so we have one more session on this on Thursday. See you on Thursday.